Hi guys, thanks for tuning in again to our Smack Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this new video and if so, please share your love below and subscribe to our channels. But now, without any further ado, enjoy the show. So first thing is, is this driving me? Second thing, it has to be fun. You know, I'm not going, leaving my career to do something that I'm going to be bored about. Welcome to a new episode from the Smack Hospitality Podcast. My name is Florian Montag and today I sat down with Olivier Bracard, CEO and co-founder at Hosco. We spoke about his entrepreneurial journey, founding and building Hosco since 2011, why he feels they're even better positioned today than before COVID and his insights on the future of recruitment in the hospitality industry. Enjoy the show. This episode is brought to you by Apaleo. Apaleo is a hotel tech startup and with their open hospitality platform and app ecosystem, they simplify hotel operations and help hotels to unlock their digital potential. Their dynamic team is rapidly growing and they are looking for exceptional talent to join them on their mission. Check out their open positions on apaleo.com slash careers. Enjoy the show. Hi, Olivier. It's great to have you on the show. Hi, Florence. Thanks for having me. Olivier, you are also an alumni from EHL like myself and also a successful entrepreneur with building uh, Hosco. But before we jump into your whole Hosco story, I would really would love to know more about your path into hospitality. Where did you start? How did you, how did you start? Uh, and, and, and where does your passion for hospitality come from? Yeah, sure. So, um, look, I think giving a bit of background, no? so um, I was born and raised in France, uh, French father, Spanish mother, and on my mother's side, uh, where her family were hoteliers, right, in the early 50s in, in Mallorca, in Spain. You know, the early 50s is truly when the region shifted from agriculture, fruits, veggies, textile, to actually as a start of, uh, of tourism, you know. It was really the time when... Uh, you know, the post-World War II era, where there was prosperity, growth, confidence, and, uh, and the development of travel. And also, my mother's family jumped on that opportunity, like a lot of people in Europe. And, uh, and we stayed in the business uh, until uh, very recently, actually. So we had a, a hotel there. The hotel stayed in the family until recently. And uh, I, as a child, remember spending a huge amount of time uh, playing around the hotel when I was a kid. Uh, being a father myself now, uh, I finally understand how convenient it was for my parents to outsource the kids uh, to the family hotel uh, so that they could play, they could be fed, and we could mess around with the cousins. And I guess these were my first early steps in hospitality, you know, hanging around with the staff, hanging around the facilities of the property. And I guess this is where my first uh, attraction to hospitality started. No. Um, so as I said, I was raised in France then, so I spent uh, traditional education. Uh, I was an okay student at school. I don't think I was uh, nothing uh, out of the ordinary, not really a nerd, so to say. But I guess I always did uh, what was expected to make it through. And then came the big question towards uh, you know, the age of 16, 17 of uh, where, where next? No, and uh, the usual classic path in France, if uh, you go to business administration no, or business school. No? Uh, but thankfully, I discovered that there were business schools applied to hospitality, you know, hospitality management schools. And, uh, and so my parents took me there just to, uh, to discover and that was truly a, an eye opener you know, because I thought it was a really a place where you can go beyond you know, the strict hard skills and codes of business schools and leverage uh, what I thought was in me, you know, which is uh, all that uh, soft skills, orientation to other, human-to-human -human interaction. And this is really when uh, I decided to, to make the, the real step and go to, to hospitality in school. So as you said in the intro, I, I did EHL as well. I spent four wonderful years there. Uh, and uh, since then, I always stayed very connected to hospitality. And so when, when you were looking for, for business and, and, and hospitality, and especially EHL, you kind of have a bit of really both worlds. Um, how come then after you're going out of, out of EHL, you went to JLL? So this is, you didn't really stay, did you really stay in the industry or did you first say, okay, now I've, I had so much hospitality um, 
in my career already let, let let's let, let's see how the world outside of hospitality looks like look i think let's be frank i was terrible at at hotel operations i was terrible at it and uh, so i knew very quickly at the chance that uh, i would not make a career in this but uh, i wanted to be very connected to the industry which i which i truly enjoy you know but i was really terrible <laughs> in all the operations side of the business as a as an anecdote i will always remember my first internship you know, in, uh, in kitchen. So you know, after six months, you got to go on your, on a six months internship. And so my first experience is in kitchen. I had no clue about cooking and, uh, believe it or not, a month later, there was an official, uh, complaint from the staff asking to remove me from managing the staff canteen. So I would not touch food for the staff anymore because it was just too bad. You know, so they moved me to reception. So just so you understand that very quickly early on, I understood that hotel operations were not my thing, but, um, but I knew that I always wanted to stay very connected. I loved everything around business, economics, finance, applied to hospitality. Uh, so I guess real estate was, was making a lot of sense. And you know, now everything, now what is trendy is tech and startups. But uh, back at my time, uh, real estate consultancy firms was, uh, was a fancy thing. Uh, and that was a cool trend back at the time to go to the GLL, the HVS of, uh, of the world. So this is where I apply and this is where I, I ended. You know? It was uh, staying connected to hospitality, but really focusing on, on that side of the business, which I really enjoyed, which is finance, economics, etc. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think even when I graduated um, in, in 2017, it was still, I would say, the most, uh, the cool uh, companies were definitely all the real estate, asset management, uh, real estate transaction and stuff. So so this was, and, and then now tech is coming more and more, yeah. be, becoming more and more relevant uh, in, in the hospitality industry. And we'll also definitely talk about this in, in our podcast Um Today, but I, for me, something which would be really interesting and, and, and looking at, at your transition from EHL, then going to to a big corporate like JLL, um, and and you know more of the uh, crunching numbers and, and and real estate transactions. How did you then, as a next step, kind of get to that idea of saying, "Hey, I want to become an entrepreneur. I, I want to start my own thing." Was this something which came out of, um, you know, already having your parents running uh, a hotel and, and, and having that entrepreneurship uh, gene in your, uh, from, from an early stage? Or was this more kind of, I saw an opportunity or I saw a problem in the market and I wanted to, to start solving it? Yeah. Look, I, first thing first, I mean, GLL was a, a wonderful experience. I can only recommend uh, graduates to, to go to that kind of companies. For me, it truly really was some kind of a master's program. I spent uh, a little less than four years and I learned so much, you know, so much, so much around analysis, uh, you know, really getting the ideas structured, presentation, writing to the highest levels. All of these were really hard skills that I learned at GLL and I, and I've used so much uh, after, especially at Hosco for everything around fundraising. I mean, everything I learned at GLN was has been very valuable. You know, so I spent nearly four years there. But um, I mean, I arrived at GLN in 2007, you know, which was on the record the best possible year for real estate transaction in hospitality. So I came at this moment of uh, euphoria, you know, just to give you a sense, when I came, all real estate consultants just got a 200% bonus because the year was just crazy. You know? So I come in on the hype, on the high, and then from the moment I come in, crisis starts and we've got four years of truly emergency landing across the sector. You know, the Lehman Brother crisis, massive crisis in real estate. I was based in Madrid, so the, the country was uh, heavily uh, heavily exposed to real estate. So really, I spent four years, very, very tough, uh, but extremely valuable in terms of learning. But uh, I wouldn't say that my position at GLA has been a walk in the park and a comfortable one. You know, it's been, it's been very enrich enriching, but very demanding and not necessarily, necessarily very rewarding. You know? But looking back, I'm thankful for that because that lack of comfort also pushed me to look uh, elsewhere and maybe Hosco wouldn't be here today. You know? How was so, that actually being in a company like JLL in, you know, where everything is looking so bright and then suddenly this big crash comes, you're, you're a junior in the company. Um, 
is the first thought you have, oh shit, uh, how safe is my job or, yeah. or how is your feeling? You know, we'll talk about this, no, because I have had other episodes like this uh, recently with COVID, no, but I mean, it was intense. You know, I came in, we were 400 people on the floor, you know, everything going into the right direction. And then uh, the crisis starts. I mean, when I left, we were 180 on the floor. You know, we started off, we were nine in my hotel division. I left, we were two, you know, so it was really, really, really intense. But I guess, um, you know, when, when things shake in that order, I mean, you've got the opportunity to take more ownership, to be more exposed to senior management. So I guess I, I did what I could to support, to learn. And uh, I only take this as a very positive experience, you know. But it was, uh, it was challenging, very challenging. And what did, as, as you mentioned, was this one of the, the elements which kind of you said, maybe without this, Hosco wouldn't have happened? Um, yeah. Did this show you kind of, Even corporate life is not so safe necessarily? No, it's just a thing that, you know, I think corporates have a strength, have a tendency to make people feel very comfortable, especially after a couple of years after graduation. And therefore, you may lose a bit of drive or you may become a bit uh, risk averse because you're too comfortable in your position. You know, I mean, making the jump to be an entrepreneur uh, is a big jump. And depends. sometimes you look at what I have to lose, what I have to win, you know, and if you're too comfortable somewhere, the jump is even more difficult to make. You know what I mean? So at GLL, I was in a very good position, promoted, etc. but it was not the great years, you know what I mean? So I was still thinking outside of the box and, and at least the retention side from the real estate sector was not great at that point. You know what I mean? So that hasn't been a barrier for me, but I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Always. It has always been in my DNA, in my brain. I always wanted to, to start something, to build my own thing, you know? And this started way before GLL. I remember already at EHL, you know, I had my brain on nonstop obstacle to solution mindset, you know, and uh, got such random ideas before whole school, you know, you, you have no idea of the ridiculous ideas that, uh, that can, came up. Can you, tell, can you tell us one idea uh, which, which, didn't, which didn't make it? If, if, if any, I would lose any remaining credibility, you know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's as stupid as uh, thinking of uh, stuff to remove the snow from cars in Switzerland because there's a low that you cannot go through the street with any piece of snow on your car, I mean, while it's snowing all winter, you know, crazy things like that, you know, but I think, I think all in all the, what matters the most is, is not the idea, is, is the process. Now you face something that you feel is not working right, or is there is something missing, a gap to fill, and then you try to come up with a solution, you know, and then you analyze this solution. I think I got a lot of ideas. But I, always very, I have always been very structured in my mind in order to screen those opportunities. You know? For me to leave my career, for, lead, for me to leave my position, I knew that I had to screen very carefully all the ideas that were coming up. And so I had a, a bit of a, of a matrix in my head. You know? so this idea had to drive you know, a sense of purpose, sense of passion in me. Otherwise... I'm not going to do it. I don't want to be pursuing an idea that may be great, but doesn't drive me. So first thing is, is this driving me? Second thing, it has to be fun. You know, I don't, I'm not going, leaving my career to do something that I'm going to be bored about. Third is, it has to require limited equity because I wasn't not rich at the time. You know, you're just out of graduation, four years in real estate. I mean, you have a bit of savings, but I could not say hey, tomorrow I'm going to buy a hotel and run a hotel. No, it had to require limited equity to get started. So online business was a, was a, good, a good niche for that. And then the last filter that I had is that, oh, it needs to be driving me. It needs to be fun. It needs to require limited equity, but it needs to have the potential to become something big. You know, if I'm going to do all this, if I'm going to drop my career, I'm going to go all in. There needs to be something, a big opportunity out there, you know. And Hosco was the only idea which actually made it through. Well, out of all those crazy ideas that came up, Hosco was actually the only one that made it through. And I remember when, when the idea of Hosco came up, I took my phone call my best friend from, from university, uh, from, from Lausanne, Carl, who is uh, with me now still in the business, and he's a co-founder of Hosco. And I say, hey, look, this is, I think this one is the one. You know? And so I pitched him the idea and said, okay, let me think about it. And he calls me two weeks later and said, let's do it. And this is, this is how, how many, Hosco how started. How many ideas did you, did you pitch uh, Carl in the meantime? 
<laughs> what other ideas you mean pre Oscar? How many? Like how uh, many? What no, no, no. <laughs> so he was in the snow thing that <laughs> clearly he was in. No, but uh, every idea was running through him because I knew that um, if I had to do something, I had to do it with him because I think we've got a very different set of skills, but that combine very well. So I always knew that I wanted to do something like that. So he was part of everything. And he was also pitching some ideas to me. But uh, but I guess Hosko was the first one to make it through. And so I remember there was a... The, sorry? So what were the, the, the skills? You said different skill sets already from from um, Carl. How, how did they differentiate? So you were more yep. the structured analyst yeah. Uh, with hospitality background, um, was how, how what were the core skills from from Carl? Look, I think I mean running, funding a business, and running a business is uh, requires a, a wide range of skills. And even the some of us, we were still lacking a lot, especially uh, when we are both hospitality management graduates and we started an online three sided marketplace. So we were missing a lot of, of skills, even the some of us. No, but I knew that. Uh, we had an alignment on human values, which I think is, at the, is, a, is a must as a start. And then I think in terms of our personalities and, and skill set, we were complementary. So I'm more, uh, I'm slightly more maybe creative, visionary, and uh, I like to deal with people and I like to lead teams and, and deal with clients. And so I'm more the front of house. And I guess Carl is excellent as uh, more on the rest. You know? So uh, he's very analytical. He's excellent at finance. He's excellent at uh, even in, in tech, in digital marketing, in all of a bit more of the back of the house, which is not less team and client fee thing. So I always knew that those skill set would combine very well. And look, we've been 10 year, 10 year working together. Yeah, that's that, that, that's incredible. And, and and also nice to see really that your, your hotel a background from the ground up really brought you and 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 made you definitely i think that that extrovert front of house uh front of house person with with the with a strong vision so tell us then so you 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 pitched that idea to to carl you what what were the next steps uh, look the next step is actually a funny one <laughs> so we reached out to a digital agency in order to design some uh uh, I don't know if I if I should say that, but I'm go I'm gonna go for it. So we actually designed fake business cards, fake brochures, a, a landing page saying something's coming soon, but there was actually nothing coming soon. And so we book ourselves holidays, me at JLL, him at this company back at the time, and we go on a road trip. So we go to London, to Paris, to Madrid, to Geneva, and we meet we meet HR director and say, hey guys, this is coming up. This is gonna be the thing. We're gonna bring all talents in hospitality in one place to make you save time hiring the best talents in hospitality. It's coming out in three months. Are you in? And if you're in, you need to sign this letter of interest. You know? <laughs> and, and so, and the name of the company was awful. It was not Osco. It was something called EHHR, which was Excellent Hospitality. I mean, something awful. And but anyway, so we do all this trip, and I remember the. The worst, the worst and best part of the thing was that when we finish that road trip at the holidays and we go back home, we sit down on this sofa and say, uh, what do we do now? Because we got all this and all this looks positive, uh, but now we need to make the tough call, which is time to resign and then to get started. You know, and this is how it started off. I decided to take the lead on this because we didn't have the financials to both take a, a time off from our career. So I started off alone for the first two and a half years. And then when we closed our first round funding round in 2014, Cal then joined us uh, in the team as well. Okay, yeah. That, so that's that's really the, the, the I would say, a bit of a, a traditional kind of way of, of getting them out. So one person saying, okay, I commit. And, and and let's not kind of quit all the jobs directly, but but go there step step by step. And and, and you have a commitment for your friend that if things don't go well, it will feed you until you find something else. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But how how did it actually go in the in, in in the next step? Did you manage the the three months? Did you launch something in three months? Or no, no, we or... didn't. We didn't. But we leveraged our people skills to let them know that actually things were taking taking a little longer. And instead of three, it was going to be twelve months. And, uh, and look, things, uh, they were still on board. No? But I think we really, you know, when you have a career, uh, we had to change country. We had to invest money, quite a lot of money to get things developed, et cetera. We wanted to make sure that there was a true appetite for, for the product that we were about to roll out. And so we wanted this to be very credible. No? So this is why we went with, a, with something pretty official to really make sure that uh, the appetite was there. Definitely. You, you, you can already by this, by, here by the name, 
uh, that or the initial name that you try to make something quite quite official and 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 uh, um, excellency and and all of that. Um, <laughs> yeah. But how did you? How, so 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 you then decided? Okay, we pitch it. We get some we get some LOIs. Mm -hmm. Quit night. Quit your job. You go for it. Um, but you mentioned already. You know, you you have complementary skill skill sets, but development is not really mm -hmm. something yet. So what what was the next step? Was it raising some money and and, and getting some family and friends uh, yeah. money in to be yeah. able to to develop some some mockups and the first platform, or did you go out and and do more research? Did you did you hire maybe no. an, another developer? How how did you start all of that? You know, I think you know. If I had to do a school over again, I think I would. I would with Carl. We would do it in three or four years, in or five instead of ten. You know, but uh, you know, we were twenty-five, fresh to tech, fresh to the digital world, and uh, we needed support, right? So, first thing we got, we got funding from family and friends, as you say, and then we developed our first uh, version of Osco, which was a very basic version of Osco, but in partnership with a uh, with an agency. In Switzerland, uh, who supported us for the first couple of years, and uh, we rolled out the first product with them. The funny story is that this agency, the founder of this agency, ended up uh, leading our first round of financing. So we were clients, and he saw the traction, and they say, "Hey guys, we sh you you're onto something. Uh, is there a way to get more involved?" And this is how we structure our first funding round in 2014. Yeah, that's that that that's perfect. Did you then do kind of I don't know if that's to uh, if if this is disclosed or not, but did they really then also commit to further development? Uh, and and was it kind of like hey, we give you some money, but we also give you some some yeah. resources. I remember with when when we founded Hotel Hero right out of um, out of Lausanne also was kind of definitely that uh, was not just the money, but it was also just having that manpower in in development mm -hmm. uh, or. Um, Mm -hmm. to to be able to 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 launch these kind of projects yeah so it's not media for equity it's product for equity no but yeah. uh I, I, yes there was a, there was there was a similar commitment but soon we acknowledged the fact that uh, we wanted to have our tech in-house you know so we continued to develop our product with the agency then at a certain point we were all aligned that uh, things were really trying starting to take shape and we, we needed more responsiveness more ownership more expertise so this is when we started to to bring the product in-house you know and so then we part of the round of financing was uh, was cash which was uh, a good contribution to get started with our own internal tech team Then let's uh, and 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 when was that again? Just to put that in, in context, yeah, 2014. Uh, it's, so we started off Osco 2011, end of 2011, 2012 to 2014. We've really been struggling to polish the product, polish the approach, and make sure that we had a pricing that makes sense, a product market fit that was truly there. And really, 2014 was the year where really start, things started to kick in. So we really developed this SaaS product for schools. We really got traction with more employers and talents and this is where we closed our first funding round of half a million euros that was 2014 right okay yeah interesting can you for for the listeners you know today you can uh, you say your mission is to empower the hospitality mm -hmm. industry by connecting inspiring and providing opportunities to all its professionals around the world mm -hmm. um This is definitely the the, the fine tune after after several years. Mm -hmm. Was this always um, your 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 aim? Did, were there pivots uh, in in the meantime? And maybe could you quickly describe where did you with what idea did you start and yeah, sure. what you offer today? Look, I think uh, the strength that we had is that we we started a business on a vertical that we knew well and uh, a space that we knew well. I mean, all started off by our experience as students. You know, we had, our student experience was good, but there were lowlights. I mean, uh, we studied at uh, one of the greatest schools in the planet, great, but there were lowlights. I truly found the lack of orientation to know where should I go for my internships, where should I go for my first job, where in terms of destinations, where in terms of career paths, or where in terms of employer. You know, the industry is one of the largest in the planet. It's so fragmented. There is tens of thousands of employers out there. Where do I fit? Where should I go? And what is my world of opportunity? You know, and we truly felt that gap, 
you know, as students and then graduates. And then as I graduated and evolved at GLL, et cetera, I was on the employer side, you no? Know, and when looking to hire people for the team, I also felt the pain, you know, the pain of the fragmentation on the market. You know, so many schools out there, small to medium-sized schools using different technologies, the lack of direct access to talents, you know, and a lot of low-tech local job boards in hospitality. All in all, all this was very inefficient. And the biggest conclusion of this is to say hospitality is one of the largest employer on the planet. If there is one thing that makes it unique, it's its international component. And when you put that on paper and realize that pre-HOSCO, you didn't have any international recruitment platform in hospitality, you understand that there is a huge gap to fill. No? And this, this gap is driving those efficiencies, both on the B2C side, on the talent side, and on the B2B side, on the employer side. No? So... Osco started based on our experience to say hospitality is great. It's one of the most wonderful industries on the planet. I mean, you get to work with people from all over the world. You get to, you can join in at any, any education levels. You can whatever, but there's a lot of low lights, you know, and uh, the role of Osco is to tackle those low lights. So people make the most of their journey in hospitality. That's why we exist. This is our role. This is our passionate purpose is to make hospitality an exciting journey for talents. This is why we're here. No? And if you think about the product that we have right now, obviously the core business of Osco is uh, is job. So we orient, uh, guide people to to jobs that we feel are are great fit for them. But beyond the strict access to jobs that great employers, we try to provide them guidance on the employers, the destination, the career paths that are best for them. And recently, we've also added another component of that, which is continuous training. No? So now the world is evolving. You need to be on a lifelong learning model. So we will take your hands throughout your career, beyond finding a job, beyond choosing your career path, we will support you on the journey so that you can continue make it through in hospitality. No? So that's where we stand. Osco evolved a lot. We are now one of, I would say, the biggest international recruitment platform in hospitality, even at the national level. We are the dominant recruitment platform in several countries. And really, the aim is to make Osco the dominant global recruitment platform in hospitality. And as we speak, we have 1.3 million professionals active on the site. We're supporting 10,000 employers. And we have 450 education centers who are partners of Hosco, out of which more than 100 have their internal career site powered by the Hosco technology. So that's that roughly where we stand right now. Impressive. Very, very impressive what, what, what you've built over over the years. And, and I can just imagine, as you also said, what a roller coaster um, this must must have been. Um, one one question on, on more the staff, uh, the, the, the the talent which is on your platform, is it more uh, people just out of hotel schools and, and looking more for junior positions? Yeah. Or are you also working yourself up, I would say, more into direction of management, uh, executive levels? Yeah. Look, I think we try, I mean, in all honesty, we started with the ambition to disrupt a bit recruitment in early careers in hospitality. No? So we said, hey, you know what, you've got a lot of low-tech local job boards in hospitality that are adding little value to the, to, to the equation. Let's take a reverse approach. We're going to be global from the start as the industry, but we cannot win 300 million talent from day one. So let's start on a niche of this hierarchy where we can really relate. And these are people out of schools. So we started off from day one being a global player, partnering with the best hotel schools on the planet and bringing their students and early grads on the planet to match them to global opportunities. So this is how we started off. But obviously, those people stayed on Hosco. We became top of mind when thinking about their next job. And therefore, our vision evolved beyond early careers recruitment only to actually be the one-stop solution for employers in hospitality. As we speak now, I think students might represent 5 to 10% of the pool of talents. And 90% are active professionals of any profession, any seniority. And on Hosco daily, you've got people hired for department heads, GMs, uh, executive chefs, or interns. You've got so we really pitch ourselves as a one-stop solution for employers in hospitality right now. In in your path over over the the past years, when was the point where you said, "Oh yes, we we've made it. Uh, we're not we're not a startup anymore. We're we're maybe a scale up, um, but you know Hosco." has you've you've achieved at least your first uh, vision look i think we've never thought we've made it you know we we are on such a global industry such a, a fast growing industry that whatever market share we got is 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 nothing 
is a drop on the ocean, and this is what's what's keeping us very excited. No? So we've never thought that we've done it. No, what we thought is that we're hitting certain milestone. You know, if you look at February 2020, just uh, at the premise of COVID, 50 to 60 percent of all five-star hotels in European capitals had an active client, an active subscription with OSCO. Well, that's a milestone. You know, 50 to 60 percent of all five-star hotels in European capitals have a subscription with OSCO. That means that you really managed to position yourself as the one-stop dominant solution for that upscale segment in key EU cities. No, that's a milestone. No? What's next? Well, we keep on, on growing there. We look at all the secondary cities, secondary destinations, new markets, and new segments of their pyramid. You know? So moving out from pure upscale to uh, uh, maybe startups, uh, cruises, and uh, and even small small employers that may not have a star rating. You know what I mean? So let's embrace the diversity of hospitality. But the first key focus has been five star, fine dining, key cities, you know, and we hit that milestone and then we started to expand beyond. So I'd say there's been milestones and we've been on a great trajectory. COVID has been tough and I guess we'll talk about this, but, uh, but we've hit that milestone, but we are at the 1% today of where we want to be truly. We are at the 1% of our potential and this is what's very exciting. Yeah. As you said, uh, the goal needs to be, or uh, you, you require for an idea that it has a potential to become big. And if you yeah. say that you're only at 1% of your vision, then you, you know, it really I always, shows how big, how I, big I, it is. I, I always <laughs> share these stats, you know, because, uh, you know, there are certain days on which we, we onboard a lot of new clients. So this is very exciting for the team. You know, you feel strong, etc. And I also always drop this fact, you know, that Marriott is opening a new hotel every 14 hours. You know, yeah. So for us just to keep up with the new supply in the market, we will need to already be signing a lot more. You know, so yeah. let's let's bring back to a bit of a humility in there, and let's let ourselves to work. You know, before we we jump on on the big topic which you already mentioned, uh, COVID, um, could you just quickly highlight what's your business model? How do you earn money with yeah. Fosco? Look, we've got a traditional uh, marketplace model with a subscription model. So uh, the core of the revenue stream of Osco comes from employers looking to hire the very best talents in hospitality efficiently. So we have annual subscriptions with employers that provide them roughly three main things. One is visibility towards the best talents in hospitality. Second is option to be reactive in recruitment, so an inventory of jobs that they can list to attract talents. And the third piece is a proactive approach so that they can handhunt talent for specific opportunities that they have through the whole school talent pool. A bit of a LinkedIn model, to be honest. Now, then we've got some minor employer branding related initiatives that also make some, some meaningful revenue. That's about 70, 75% revenue stream. So the rest lies into um, our partnership with education, OSCO, the OSCO technology is used as a SaaS. So we are a SaaS-enabled marketplace. So the OSCO technology is used as the private internal career and alumni platforms of more than 100 education centers on the planet. I mean, that if you reach out to a school in the Philippines, say, hey, I want to hire talent from your school, the answer will be go to my OSCO platform. So this is a wonderful revenue stream, but it's creating also a lot of network effect because all those schools using our technology to power the current alumni are obviously ambassadors of the OSCO network. No? So this is representing, let's say, 15% of the revenue stream. And then the last component is what we started off during COVID, which is truly booming, is our subscription for training solutions. No? When recruitment stopped to be top of mind, we said, what else can we do? And we moved uh, ourselves to training, learning. And this is something that we started off, which is, uh, which is very promising. Yeah, if, if, if you now look at your, your revenue streams and, and, and how your business was structured, Definitely COVID makes makes sense that it was a huge impact uh, for mm. Hosco. If you say, what, 70% was hotels or hospitality businesses paying to be able to recruit. I'm sure first thing which happened on, on the recruitment side for in the hospitality industry of COVID was we stopped hiring, we stopped paying uh, for, for, for these kind of tools. How did you cope with it? And, and when did you realize, oh shit, this is big? Look, I mean, COVID was, was tough. Coming with COVID was really rough, you know. When you are an entrepreneur, um, I guess you always think that the most difficult years are the early years. You know, the first years where you you, you try to fit that idea to the real pain of your audience. You try to get known. You try to get initial traction, and you always try start to think that, you know, ten years in, 
really fast growing, good success. The, the, the most difficult part is behind us, no? And then comes COVID. <laughs> and then comes COVID and that's, uh, that's just unprecedented and that's been massive. As you say, we move from being top of mind to employers truly struggling to hire talents in hospitality because talent shortage was already present way, way, way before COVID. So we move from being top of mind to actually being useless, to actually having employers asking us, can you help me getting rid of my people? So it's it's been a shift that was from one day to the other that was very very rough. You know? So we we basically had to make sacrifices, of course. I mean, when you have a sales floor of 40, 50 people and no one can make a phone call, obviously you have to you have to be pragmatic. So we had to to make sacrifices. We worked on our funding to make it through the storm, and we also somewhat pivoted. You know, and we we acknowledge that. Regardless, learning and education is something that needs to go digital to face the upcoming talent shortage and the previous talent shortage. And anyway, people are stuck at home and they've got nothing to do but uh, work on their CV, work on their skills. No, we started off to look at uh, at training in hospitality, and uh, and we launched that yeah six months in into COVID, and uh, and it works. And it's working very well, very very well. But I guess, uh, yeah, COVID was tough, but uh, since the months of, uh, yeah, since Q2 of 2021, Steam started to shift and we've been ourselves impressed by the surge of demand of employers. We've been on a very, very strong recovery trend, which actually, you know, was above expectation, has been positive, but we were coming from 18 months of really, really emergency landing and unprecedented, uh, unprecedented case. What, what did this mean for you as you know co-founder i mean you've as you said you started it right after the, your first job you grew a company and then suddenly this huge crisis came there what was how did you feel uh, personally and also what were the characteristics you as a leader had to maybe show for your team to be able to you know where it was clear like hey we need to make sacrifices we need to need to yeah. make decisions which hurt However, we should not lose focus of, of the overall vision and, and where we want to get to. Yeah. I won't hide from the fact that there's been hard work, sweat and tears. You know, it's been, it's been rough, you know. But I'd say that looking back, I wouldn't exchange this period in the journey for anything. Because I think that myself as, as a manager, myself as a founder and my team, you know, we're coming out of this much more mature much more focused, much more efficient, and and at a level of, of confidence and commitment that was uh, that is ten times higher than pre COVID. So I wouldn't remove that from the journey. Now looking back, you know, uh, and I feel that the level of maturity, as I said, is is, is much higher. But uh, but it was rough, and I think some key learnings uh, from me from the period is first off, don't say things when you don't know. I will always remember start of COVID. Uh, you know, it was a Thursday. We were in the office and uh, we were with the head of people and culture and say, hey, you know what? Maybe tomorrow, Friday, we do a trial and send everyone home just in case to make sure that everyone can work from home. And this is this is functional, you know, and, but on Monday, everyone comes back, you know. So we did that on a Friday and we never came back. <laughs> we never came back to that office ever again. You know, and so I remember on that same Thursday saying, "Hey, on Monday we're back." Taking the team, say, "Hey guys, don't worry. I mean, we've got the, we've got the business under control. This is not going to last long." I mean, I learned my way that you don't say, don't pronounce yourself when you don't control all elements, and when you don't know. You know, mm-hmm. but that was a learning. The second thing is, I mean, we made it through because of the team. We made it through because of the culture. And we made it through because of, uh, of the commitment that we have to the vision, to the purpose that we're serving. And I guess this trend is mainly driven by the level of transparency that we have with everyone in the company. I mean, we are extremely transparent, no ego, flat uh, management style. And this is what keeps people in. You know, when, when you're in the storm, people want to hear truly where you are, where you stand. And you better be transparent. And I think this is this is also a learning that I think one thing that we did well was to always stay very transparent. You know, and uh, as I said, we made this through because of the team. And uh, one key thing that I think we did well was to know very well from the start who do we need, who is vital to make it through. You know, who who unfortunately we would have to let go 
and uh, thankfully we were able to call uh, back some people since uh, things started off again but we you need to be very agile and very proactive in thinking of okay who are my key bets who are my key pillars that i need to make it through you know so mm -hmm. i think these were key key learnings and one thing that i think i now looking back one thing that has been important is you know there is a, this very simplistic view of uh, the change curve you know i don't know if you know this there is a this change curve where you have six or seven steps you know uh, which is first is a denial this cannot be happening second one is a frustration why is this happening to me this is so unfair then there is depression or oh, we're not going to make it through and then you start to accept and then you start to embrace and then you ended up starting emerging stronger ever you know but this change curve i think applies to a lot of things in life and a lot of things in business and i think you as a founder and manager you need to be one step ahead. You need to know that you're going to go through all those all those steps. And you need to be aware of the fact that your team will also go through all those steps. But your role is to go all those to go through all those steps as quickly as possible. And the best way for that is for you to embrace the next step more quickly and take your team to the next one. Take your team to the next one. Let's not take them to embracement in while we're still in the frustration mode. You know what I mean? But I think this was very, very, very useful for me to try to understand where I stand, where my team stand and try to move ahead to the next one and take my team with me. That's been very, very strong. And I'd say that, uh, as I said, I think Hosco as a business, as a team is emerging a lot stronger even than, than pre-COVID. And we are at a level of confidence for the future ahead that, uh, that is higher than pre-COVID now, you know, but, uh, mm -hmm. but it's been a very demanding experience. Yeah, that's that, that's very interesting, and 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 you you also spoke about about that shift um, in mindset internally, but definitely also so in the market. Um, how did you see, or what are your insights at the moment? How has you know the hiring process in the industry or the the needs of the industry evolved through through COVID? Is it really still focused mainly on on hiring? You also mentioned you know bringing out our own product training elements of course during COVID, but do you also see that play out much more importantly um in the in the years ahead mm -hmm. yeah so i think to answer your first part of the question you need to understand the trend that we were in i mean our industry hospitality has been on a tremendous growth path And until COVID, I mean, we've tripled the volume of international travelers in 20 years, etc. So, so the volume of job creation over the last decade had been crazy, you know, and that was driven by technology, prosperity of uh, of people, and also the demographics. You know, more people with more money uh, able to travel thanks to more technology, and this was leading really to growth of our industry. And we came to the point where we have over 330 million people working in hospitality pre-COVID. But pre-COVID, already we already had 80 percent of countries on the planet facing a talent deficit in hospitality. So meaning more jobs than people willing to take those jobs. That was already the situation pre-COVID. What happened with COVID? Well, actually, we lost about 60 million people headcount in, in the crisis. Could have been a lot worse if we didn't have all those subsidies from governments. But the net balance decreased by 60 million through COVID. And where do we stand right now? As we are embracing recovery, etc., we only added 2 million new jobs since uh, the start of uh, the research of travel. Why is that? Because we, ac we had a lot of people on furlough pending that we have been activating to, to help the recovery. And what is the situation right now? I mean, the latest forecast is that the industry needs to find 50 million people in the next 24 months to sustain the recovery, to sustain the growth ahead. 50 million people. That's a lot of people to bring on board, plus all the turnover that's going to happen on the core of the people already enrolled. So it's going to be a huge, great rehiring exercise that has already started. So that's where we stand now. But all in all, <laughs> the market is extremely tense. There is a clear shift of power that has happened, which is a power in the hands of talents. And you've got employers that are extremely struggling to bring people in. 
And the impact of that is, is twofold. I mean, the negative impact of that is that uh, people that are still in the business are overworked, a lot of, uh, lot of pressure, a lot of work, etc. So a lot of level of service may decrease because we're missing people or we're bringing people in that are not yet super qualified. So all those kind of things. But on the highlights, uh, we already see that a lot of policies have evolved more than a, in a year that they've been evolving in the last 10 years. I mean, we have employers implementing four days, four, four days week for culinary staff in order to ensure mental health. We have clients implementing paid extra hours, which was nothing the case pre-COVID. So we've got, we've seen a lot of new policies coming in because employers are acknowledging the fact that they need to move, they need to evolve, they need to work on their employer brand and they need to evolve in, in they need to work on the value proposition to make it true because we need to embrace this great rehiring. We need to make it happen. So we've seen a lot of positives on that note already. And how did, so is it adding more value, of course, because you don't have enough staff? Um, is it also really the, the people looking for jobs? I mean, we often talk about a lot of people leaving the industry. Is it just because in other industries, they have already all of this kind of, you know, pay being paid for extra hours, etc. that we need to make the industry more attractive again. Is this a, a problem of, of the general marketing of our or employer branding of an industry as such? Look, there's no definite answer. We do have data thanks to the network we have now, but uh, we know what people, why people come. We know why people leave and we've got intuition of why people that could come are not coming. You know, so I'll take you through that. No, I, guess, I think this is the best possible answer. We know that the main drivers for people to come to hospitality is a genuine passion for the industry. It's a genuine attraction to the business. That's, that's the biggest driver to the industry. Now, and then the industry has all those unique uh, value proposition components that are uh, international, uh, travel, explore the world, be exposed to different culture, work in teams, get a thank you every 15 minutes if you are front of house in, with guest interaction. You've got also the opportunity to grow, to make it through the hierarchy. So you've got a lot of highs and this is what's, what, what brings people in the industry. But what, what takes people out of the industries is partially what you've mentioned, you know, salaries that are not super competitive, benefits and perks that are somewhat inexistent. And when you look at other industries where they're looking at, benefits and perks is a big topic. You've got the stress and the workload, the lack of career progression. I mean, let's talk about career progression. 80% of employers in our industries are small and medium-sized employers, 80%, right? So those businesses do not have the financial capability to have a physical trainer training the staff uh, on the floor, right? So we need to think of new things in order to support that. No? So we know why people come and why people leave. And then the third group of people is people that could come that did make the decision not to come. Maybe there is a lack of awareness about the opportunities in hospitality. There's also a lack of, of branding. A lot of people think about hospitality as service and service not as an art, but as a servitude. And they don't want to be associated with that. And we need to work on that. And the last component is, especially through COVID, the, love, the beta risk of our industry has increased. I mean, COVID has been in the, uh, hospitality has been in the news a lot through COVID, as being really hit, as being a very risky career path. So I guess there is a lot of parents out there and a lot of people thinking of their careers, thinking, am I making a risky bet by going into hospitality? So I think all of these elements are are very valuable and meaningful to try to shape recommendations and roadmaps to, 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 to tackle the challenge that we've got ahead. Yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting. And I think, as you already mentioned, that it's such a, there's so many levels uh, to, this, to this issue. I think it's definitely an industry which has neglected um, this topic of, of employees um, for quite some time, but also, you know, because it was always a guaranteed job. And now with, with the industry, being so much in 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 the media as you said with negative media or at least not being sure anymore with and w myself talking to a lot of hotel chains you know they they tell them their staff hey we cannot promise you that we don't send you back into furlough uh in in a few weeks months we don't know what the governments will do mm -hmm. um so hopefully now we are in 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 a in a much better position with omicron etc et um you know not having that big impact anymore or the same impact as as maybe um, before, but looking at, um, you know, going also a bit at, at the end of, of time of, of our podcast, we could, I've, I'm sure, talk for hours about this, really giving a last 
outlook into the future. What do you think today? What should we do? What 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 can you do? What are you doing with Hosco? Um, and and what can the industry do to be more attractive again? Of course, mm -hmm. um, is it really just everybody working by themselves and and adding um, you know benefits, etc.? Or is it the industry needs to come together and we need to really have an impact and a change in in the general industry from top to bottom? Mm -hmm. I think. I mean, a lot of change has already started, but not enough, no. Uh, but I think it all comes down to what we think is a, is the right role and the right vision, which is one of Hosco, but is also beyond Hosco. And I think it all comes down to, again, making hospitality an exciting journey for talent. You know? People, I mean, in the hospitality has so much to offer for people. It has this ability to be a unique value proposition to talents, right? To, so to be a career of a lifetime, you know? But there are a lot of things that needs to be worked on, you know? And this is where OSCO fits, where we try through our technology, content, data, and network to fit in and to make a difference. But uh, there is <laughs> hundreds of more players that, that need to do, move into that direction. And we are seeing moves in that direction, especially from governments, you know? There's a lot of initiatives that are launched into that direction. I think my take it goes into couple of initiatives. The first one is we need to treat and protect our people better, you know? And uh, the first thing is people need to think of hospitality as not necessarily a heavily risky industry. And I'm thinking about uh, unemployment benefits. You know, we have, through COVID, we've had some very, very sad and dark stories of people employed with uh, very very low protected freelance contracts. And when COVID came, being laid off and having nothing. You know, when this happened and this makes the news, people see hospitality as being very risky. And we cannot do that to our people. Demand them hard work, excellence, and when things go dark, just throw them in the street. So I think first thing is there needs to be more policies, more standards in place around contracting, et cetera, et cetera, and employment benefits to protect our people better. I mean, this is a key area of focus. No? We need to respect working hours. We need to respect days off and to offer decent salaries. So the first thing is treating people better. I think this is, a, this is a simple but yet so powerful element. Second thing is we need to be aware of what other sectors are doing. You know, if you look at tech, if you look at logistics, if you look at retail, I mean, all those industries where our staff with their soft skills are leaking to, uh, I mean, they are extremely competitive and we need to raise the bar of competitiveness or hospitality. You know? And what are people demanding, especially the new generations? They want to be sold a purpose, you know, a vision. They want to be they want to be contributing to something you know it's they're not heavily only money driven people want to be part of something you know and so we need every employer us as an industry we need to sell a vision a purpose and people need to feel that they are contributing to that you know so shape clear roles purposes human values and then especially the gen new generations they want to travel the world i think it was uh, accord ceo uh, sebastian bazin said that one of the decisions he made through COVID is he needs to move people every 24 months of new position, new destination. Great, exactly that. People come to hospitality to experience the world, to make new interactions, meet new people, work with culture. Let's move people around. You know, let's let let's not keep people stuck in the same role for five years because this is not working anymore. You know, so work on the competitiveness of the industry through the flexibility when we can offer the geographic mobility. Uh, really, the purpose that we need well, that we need to promote. And the last thing is around education. I think. Um, you know, there are so many people out there that would be brilliant at hospitality, but they don't know about hospitality or they don't know how to get started in hospitality, but they would be amazing. And I think today the education model that we have in hospitality is not fitted. I mean, we have expensive hospitality management school focusing on the 1% of the hierarchy. And then we've got a very physical installation with a cost very, I mean, it's not fitting. We need an education model that fits the masses, that fits the millions of people that need to be brought into the hospitality, skilled and continuously upskilled to progress in their careers, both to address the acquisition and the retention side. So we need a new form and shape and, and proposition for, for education through education centers, through employers. And this is where also we want to, we want to make a difference ourselves, you know, so treat your people better, be more competitive and let's focus on, on training to get people in and to keep people in. Yeah. It's, um, it's so true what you're saying. And, and, you know, some of the things, they sound so, so basic, but, um, Olivier, before I, I let you go, uh, I, I always have one last question. 
Um, and this is, um, is there any, you know, book, podcast, um, maybe also just um, an attitude or something which you would uh, have our listeners to have as a takeaway or as a recommendation from your side um, for this podcast? Beyond listening to Smack, right? Exactly. Beyond <laughs> listening to these inspiring stories like yourself. <laughs> Look, um, I think in all the modesty, I, I can only share things that have been very valuable to me. Uh, I think as soon as I took the time to go out of my bubble and meet people that, uh, that have done it before or books of people that have again done this before, I found it so valuable. And this is his really time nicely invested that was making a difference. You know, and, and I can only recommend people to surround themselves and to go out and to, to, and people are willing to help and spend time reading books. I mean, this has been really game changing. And I think a, a more general note, I think uh, is for, for everyone. If I, I think I feel myself very privileged of being extremely happy in my career so far. Hopefully it continues now. And, uh, and even through the tough times, etc., I have been able to, you know, genuinely wear a smile going to work, you know? And I think, I think as a general note, I think everyone needs to demand uh, to be happy at work, to be happy in his career, to enjoy his career, because there's so much opportunities out there that there is no reason why not to make that step. And you need to demand people, the employers, etc., to enjoy your career, but you also need to demand it to yourself. And sometimes you have to make changes and you need to be brave enough to make those changes and to make bold moves, but demand to yourself to be, to be, to enjoy your career, because this is so rewarding and so enriching, you know, and I feel very privileged so far to be in that position. That's a great closing statement. Olivier, thank you so much for this inspiring conversation and, and you know, sharing your story, but also your vision for the industry. It was a great pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. No, thanks, Fabian. Thanks for having me. That's it for this episode, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to share your thoughts on this episode and everything else that is going on at Smack with us by checking out our website at smack.media or connect with us on LinkedIn, YouTube, or Instagram. We'll see you next time. Hi there and congrats, you've made it to the end of our video. If you'd like to stay on top of what's happening at Smack, subscribe to our channels below and follow us on our social media. Thanks and see you soon.